as he assumes the guise of Caiaphas, the high priest. Please stand to welcome the high priest. <laughs>
riding your animals, the uh, camels or whatever, or what you had ridden, the donkeys, and you slept right with the animal and provided heat. The woman would appear in the end should be considered to be a harp. These places were very unclean and crawled with vermin and fleas. And some Roman authors have indicated it's better to sleep outside in the fields than in a Palestinian inn. It was not a proper place for a baby to be born. And the woman giving birth and the blood involved in childbirth would have made the people unclean for 40 days or 80 days as the case may be. So the innkeeper provided a nice clean place in his own cave where he kept his animals. If you go to Bethlehem today and go under the church of the Nativity, you'll see the remains of the old cave there that was used as a stable. But the couple had privacy and where they could be alone and the child was born there in the stable and the innkeeper actually did a good deed. I was looking through 350 English poems coming over the airplane today and only one out of 350 praised the innkeeper for his act of service. Uh, just for one Christmas, how many of you would say a good word for the Bethlehem Innkeeper, my dear friend? Uh, children come home from Sunday school singing that terrible little song, Knock, 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 and the mean old man wouldn't let them come in. They spread such hatred at Christmas time, you Christians do and see. Uh, I'd like for you to take a pledge with me to sing. Please sigh after me, please. I pledge. That for one Christmas, I'll say a good word about the Bethlehem innkeeper. And correct anyone who says otherwise in the middle of the sermon or out on the street. Where would that end? I'm in. I wanted to get that word fence in for my good friend, the innkeeper. Get so tired of innkeeper bashing every Christmas in <laughs> Christian church. But anyway, childbirth would make a person unclean. And I can only live with my wife two weeks out of every month, instead of ritually pure, be able to serve in the temple. So as far as the law is concerned, I was very ritually pure. My sons would testify to that here uh, this evening. How many of you women have produced Sons, raise your hand. Let's give them a round of knocking on the wood. <laughs> How many have produced daughters? I saw say, Morning <laughs> <laughs> for 30 days. <laughs> My own wife was from uh, the tribe of Levi. It was very important that the priest stay within the tribe. She's a very uh, holy woman in her own right has produced many sons. And it's very important, of course, to marry women with money so that you can go ahead in life. How many of you did marry women with money? <laughs> I'm looking for a third wife. If anyone's available with money, I'll be glad to talk with you. <laughs> Assuming we want to use this medium of the pictures take a tour of the Jewish temple, the best way of understanding my ritual duties there. Then if you want to, we'll talk about the trial of Jesus. I'd rather not, but of course to a will. And I want you to see something of the great beauty of the Jewish temple. We can turn the lights out and get on the slides. We'll look at these wonderful uh, pictures of what the Jerusalem temple was uh, all about. Jerusalem Temple covered some 36 acres on top of Mount Moriah, much larger than many of your churches. So interesting to me, visiting around in churches, that when people read the New Testament, they visualize Baptist churches when they come to the temple with steeples and white columns. But the Jewish Temple is made up of a series of interlocking courtyards covering 36 acres on top of Mount Moriah, going all the way to Solomon's time, now 150 years before Christ on your calendar. Uh, Mount Moriah is very important to Judaism where Abraham brought Isaac to sacrifice. So the top of the mountain was leveled off and it loomed over the old city of Jerusalem that was down in the valley. 
And the temple was built and then destroyed in 587 B.C. in your calendar uh, by the Babylonians, leveled to the ground. When the Jews came back from captivity, they built another temple, but it was so ugly on the day it was dedicated, the people cried. And so Herod the Great, <laughs> 20 years before the birth of Christ, if you worship him, started a third temple in reality, although the Jews want to confess to that, that Herod never helped them do anything. So it's a total remodeling of the temple that uh, took some 80 years to finish. It was not finished in my lifetime, but it was finished in 66 A.D. on your calendar. And four years later, the Romans leveled it to the ground. But this was the temple that your Jesus walked in and Paul and others, and it was done in the very best Hellenistic style that you can see, the columns. Herod the great built the columns around the outer court that was called the court of the Gentiles. And notice in our temple, it was all open air, it seldom rains in Jerusalem, except in the winter months. And so the rabbis could walk on the beautiful porches with the columns, Hellenistic style, and teach their students. In the Gospel of John, Jesus often walks on these porches and teaches his disciples. And the porch at the bottom of the picture, which you can't see the front, is Solomon's porch. So the court of the Gentiles, covered by these beautiful porches, out in the open, just before the birth of Jesus, we had moved in the money changers into the court of the Gentiles. Before that, they had stayed outside the temple area, but we allowed them to move in. And when you came to the temple, you had to change your Jewish money into temple money. Some periods of time, we charged about 10% interest. We're doing that. I would suggest that to your churches. If you're trying to do a building campaign, <laughs> or to the seminary, too, to, to go on with your program. And also, you had to have your animals inspected for the sacrifices. We always rejected the animal and made you buy one there at twice the market rate. When the Romans destroyed our temple in 8070, they found over $7 million equivalent in your money in the Jewish temple treasury. It was sort of the Bank of Jerusalem, also. And the most important thing, uh, really, in the temple is the treasury and the money that we made there. And let me say to you, if God has blessed you, you are wealthy. There's nothing wrong in being wealthy. Don't be ashamed of it. The priestly caste was very wealthy, but we obeyed the commandments and kept God's will. And so to be fat and wealthy was a sign of God's favor. Uh, to be skinny or sick was a sign of his disfavor. And so I wanted you to know that right away. <laughs> so you would uh, enter the court of the Gentiles and look at the Roman fortress looming over the court of the Gentiles. Over 2,000 Roman soldiers were stationed there. There was even a secret entrance in the V-shaped corner where the soldiers could rush into the court of the Gentiles if there was some tumult or difficulty or riot. Every year during the Passover, we always had riots, someone claiming to be the Messiah that year, or whatever. And the Apostle Paul was arrested out here in the court of the Gentiles. They said he had brought a Gentile in the interior of the temple. The Roman guards rushed to the secret passageway, arrested Paul, and he was taken back into that prison for the whole summer. So we had a prison there. Jesus was also brought here to be beaten by the soldiers. So notice how close the Roman presence was to the temple. They could go into the five-story towers and look right down into the interior of the temple, even though we did not permit them outside the court of the Gentiles. I never could stand the Romans at all. This all say for the Romans. Just please let it say Very good. You can see the Jewish part of the temple stood in the interior of the court of the Gentiles and was surrounded by the court of the Gentiles. And there was a warning wall. Each time you went from one level of my temple to the next, you went up steps to get closer to the Holy of Holies where God dwelt. So now we would warn the Gentiles not to go any further, even at risk of their lives. Notice the gate on the entrance into the Jewish part of the temple, called the beautiful gate trees of grapes over top of it. Many of the stories in the book of Acts take place up here. The beggars would line up here. I always put money in the beggar's cup and had a trumpet player standing nearby to blow the trumpet just as I put the money in. 
I would suggest that on Sunday morning as the collection plays. <laughs> we get a lot more money that way. When I fasted, I always put white chalk on my face so people would know that I was fasting. The trouble with Christianity is you hide your good works. In Judaism, you show your good works so you influence others to do good work. When we pray, we pray right out on the street corners, uplifting our hands and looking directly up into heaven so people would know we were praying. You folks duck your heads and hide yourselves and nobody would really know you were praying. Just show it off there on the city street corner. We weren't ashamed of that. I always pick a 12 noon to say my prayers when the most people would be there on the city street. How many approve of that? <laughs> As you went through the beautiful gate, you went to the Court of the Women. The Court of the Women contained the treasury. There were 13 trumpet-shaped vessels around the Court of the Women. You put money into the trumpet-shaped vessels, went to an underground chamber where the money was counted. Notice in each corner of the Court of the Women, there was a special room. You can see there's large Roman fortress. City Street went through the fortress. Now you're looking right down into the court of the women, and you see the four corner rooms. In the upper right hand corner was the court of the lepers. Bear in mind, in biblical days, any skin rash was considered leprosy. In the Old Testament, even mildew on the wall was called leprosy. If you had ringworm, psoriasis, or any other skin rash, you had leprosy. Hansen's disease, where your fingers and toes rot off, and you always see in your Hollywood movies, really was unknown in Palestine, it was more in Egypt. So if you wake up one morning in your village and had a skin rash, you went to the village rabbi, he declared you a leper, and you had to leave until you had a bill of cleansing from Jerusalem. Even Jesus, when he healed lepers, sent them down to the temple to get a bill of approval. Inside the court of the lepers, there's a pool of water. You would go in, they would take the blood of a turtle dove and put it on your beak, uh, ear and on your big toe, send you out for two weeks, you would come back with all of the skin rash had disappeared, you would bathe in the pool and be declared clean. In the right hand bottom corner was a place for buying wood, upper left hand corner a place for buying oil, and the lower left hand corner the Nazarites, those who are taking a special vow not to cut their hair or drink strong drink for religious purposes. So all unclean people were kept in the court of the women. Next to Gentiles, Jewish women were the most unclean people. And so we had a special court for them. And when the men left the court of the women, they would leave all the children there and boys under 12 and go up the famous 15 steps through the Nicanor Gate, the most beautiful gate in the temple. <laughs> 20 Levites just to open and close. These 15 steps were the most important in Judaism, where all unclean people were pronounced clean. After you've been cleansed of your skin rash or leprosy, you would stand on the steps and receive your bill of cleansing to take back to the local rabbi. Women who have been taken in adultery would be brought here and given bitter water to drink if they dropped over dead and they were guilty. Women who have been raped would be brought here. If they were raped in the country, they were innocent. If they were raped in the city, they were guilty because uh, they could have cried out for help. Women who had given birth to children came here after 40 days for a boy, 80 days for a girl, and offered up a sacrifice for her cleansing as Mary does in the Gospel of Luke. Men and boys would go through the Nicanor Gate and to the court of Israel. The gates were closed and women could not participate in the worship services. They were not worthy to do that. And they always worshipped through their husband or father. Before marriage, you always had to take the religion of your father if you were a woman. After marriage, you always took the religion of your husband. You had no rights in religion. <laughs> Christianity has done too much for women. I have to say that. It really was a fence for me to come out this evening and see men and women sitting together. Men, this will make you unclean. Especially if you're Jewish. And so then we go through the Nicanor Gate, and the next court was the court of Israel, a long, narrow court with a wooden railing across it. The men would hand the animals over the wooden railing to the priest, and now we excluded all laymen. You had to be of the priestly caste to be in the presence of God. 
they would stand and look over the railing and have to sacrifice. Here's a beautiful mechanic egg, isn't it gorgeous? And the 15th step. As you looked across the wooden railing, the first thing you saw was a beautiful labor set on 12 bronze oxen. All the sacrificial animals had to be washed by the priest. Very unlike a Baptist service, you had to jump in the water, wrestle the ox to make sure it was clean, or throw in the goats to make sure they were clean. It was rather dangerous at times to be a priest. And priests did get gored in the process. So every animal had to be ritually pure, and we brought the water in from the nearby pool of Bethesda and poured this into the labor. The major object there in the court was the major Jewish temple building, the only covered part of the temple, standing 150 feet tall in the front, cubicle in shape, and a veil or curtain leading into the holy place where there was an incense altar, the menorah, center branch lampstand, and a table of 12 loaves of bread. This is where Zacharias was burning the incense when he heard about the birth of John the Baptist. The very back of the building of some more steps was the famous Holy of Holies. In late September or early October, I would part the veil, take the blood of the goat, and enter the Holy of Holies and sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant, which atoned for all the sins of the people for that year. I was the only one holy enough to do that. Two weeks before entering the Holy of Holies, they would lock me up in the chamber to the right and to the door and the window. So I would not be touched by a Gentile. One year, unfortunately, before the high priest was to enter the Holy of Holies, a Gentile had spat upon him in the court of the Gentiles, and he was unworthy to enter the Holy of Holies. Twenty-four hours before going in, another priest was assigned to me to tickle my nose with a feather, so I would have no unholy dreams before entering the Holy of Holies. And on the day that I entered, I had special vestments that the Romans kept locked up, and if I did their duty, I would get the best ones. And they would put a chain around my leg in case I dropped over dead, they would pull me back out without anyone else going in. Now, outside in the court of the priest, you would see it was very active. And the major feature was the altar of sacrifice, 14 feet tall. Animal sacrifices were carried out day and night. There were different animals for different offenses. And even in the year that Jerusalem fell to the Romans, the Romans surrounded our city for a year. In the last days, people were even eating their own children. They were so hungry. But we had a sacrifice on the very day the Romans breached the wall and came into the temple area. And the last priests pulled themselves up in the temple building and resisted the Roman army under Titus. And some of the Roman soldiers got so carried away, they leveled and burned our temple, even though Titus did not want it to be burned originally. So the temple has not been in existence since 70 AD on your calendar. I would come out of the Holy Holies, another goat would be taken, called the scapegoat, out to a nearby mountain in front of a cliff to come for the other sins of the people. So it was very active, as you can see, in the... Uh, a court of the priests, there were praise and special holy days, uh, such as uh, the Feast of the Lights and other fall harvest festival. We have six major festivals around the year, so it's very important to have all this activity in the temple. On the day of preparation for Passover, we killed 20,000 lambs in the temple in one day. Can you imagine 20,000 lambs? There was even a special pipe built from the high altar sacrifice down to the Kidron Valley just so the blood would be drained off. During Passover season, it was said the whole Kidron Valley in the stream there would flow with blood uh, because of all the activity. We would give the Passover lambs back to the families and they would gather in groups of ten men to celebrate the activity. Other animals were scored, the fat would be taken off, and some of the meat would be sold back to the butchers in Jerusalem certain of the sacrifices. It was quite a center of activity, as you can well imagine. Here's the warning wall, warning Gentiles not to go any further. Today, if you go to Jerusalem, this is the only remaining wall of our Jewish temple. It's 
installed the welling wall. You can see the large building blocks of King Herod. This wall goes 17 feet down to the ground. We had to build up a platform out across Mount Moriah that has 36 acres up there. And the walls were immense, as you could well imagine. Jewish people are not allowed up on Mount Moriah today because the Arabs control that area. And even though my people, the Jews, have won it back in 1967, the Orthodox rabbis do not want Jews to go up there for fear they will step in the Holy of Holies by mistake. So 600 years after Christ, the Arabs came here to Jerusalem, took this mountain, and the Arab general went out on Mount Moriah, he broke down in tears because it had been turned into a garbage dump. And the Arabs believed that Mohammed had gone to heaven on his horse from Mount Moriah, the old temple site. And after Mecca and Medina, Jerusalem is the third most holy site for the Arab people today. So from 697 on, Arabs have controlled this mount, except for a brief period during the Crusader period, 1,000 years after Christ, where they turned this dome of the rock into a church, a Christian church, there for 100 years. The Arabs took it back. All three major world religions have fought over Mount Moriah, the most fought over mountain in the world, uh, with the three major world religions all saying that the mountain is there, although the Arabs control it today. Even today, we divide the court of the, uh, the wedding wall into a court of the men and a court of the women. You have to be careful to go to the right court if you ever visit Jerusalem. Go there on a Friday night and see 20,000 Jews gathered at the wedding wall. See some of the rabbis with the old sheep horns. And up on the mountain is the Dome of the Rock, very beautiful in its own architecture. Been there since 697. Right over the Holy of Holies is this building. And I'd like to tell you a secret. Most of the temple treasury is still buried on Mount Moriah because the Romans surrounded the city for a year. If you ever go to Rome, look at the archway of Titus, you see the Roman army carrying back only the seven branch lamps. Many of the other treasures were buried there, and the Arabs have never allowed any archaeological activity here on top of the mountain, no digging. And so I'd like to tell the Raiders of the Lost Ark that most of the treasure is still there on Mount Moriah. If you want to share that news. Here is the rock. It was under the Holy of Holies. There's even a cave underneath it. And this is where the Arabs go to pray today. Down below, outside the wall, you have the Jews gathered. Notice the phylacteries on their arms and on their foreheads, reading the Torah praying that someday the temple might be rebuilt. 20,000 gathered on Sabbath Eve. If you look over Herod's wall, you see the gold dome marking the Holy of Holies. The Jewish people today get as close as they can to the Holy of Holies so that they can be near the house of God. The rock inside. Standing on the Mount of Olives, you see the outer wall of the court of the Gentiles. Right over the Arab's head is the pinnacle of the temple. How many Christians, when they read that story, think of the church spire? It was about 150 feet straight down to the Kidron Valley. It makes your head swim to stand there today. And so the outer wall here represents a rather close where the old court of the Gentile wall stood in my day and time, even though this is a more modern wall. Standing on the Temple Mount, you look across at the Mount of Olives. We had three mountains in Jerusalem, Mount Zion in the upper city of Jerusalem, uh, Mount Moriah where the Temple was located, and the Mount of Olives. You can see the huge Jewish cemetery there on the Mount of Olives. Every Jew would love to be buried here in the Mount of Olives because this is where the Messiah is going to come when he returns. And so thousands have been buried there from all over the world. Right on the top of the Mount of Olives, you see the church steeple marking the place where Jesus ascended into heaven, so the Christians say. And you see the little teardrop chapel in the middle of the picture where Jesus stood over the city of Jerusalem and wept, and the Christians have built a little chapel in the shape of a teardrop. At the bottom is the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed the night before he was arrested. And inside the temple on the beautiful rock, 
old temple complex covering some 36 acres. Like I said, you can go to Jerusalem today, you can go to an outside park and see the whole city rebuilt in miniature form. These pictures have taken, been taken from there. Each time there's a new discovery in Jerusalem, they put it into the model city. You can walk around Jerusalem as it was in the first century. Uh, let's turn the lights back on, and uh, how many have been impressed by my temple? <laughs> how many like to visit it? You can say, well, I took a righteous man to stand before God's presence. God dwelled in the Holy of Holies, and yearly I went into the Holy of Holies, stayed about a half hour, closed the veil, and he remained there until the next year. It's my duty to protect God from all unclean people. This is why we have these walls erected, separating the different classes of people. <clears throat> the biggest weakness of the Christian church today is that you've eradicated the walls. You let the unclean people sit with the clean. You were led into that mistake by the Apostle Paul. You, by the way, fell off of his donkey and hit his head on the way into the man. <laughs> that was his problem. In his letter to the Ephesians, he says, Christ has broken down the walls. So I have proof of that by the scripture. And now, men and women are one, he says in Galatians. And all the people say, yeah, That's what the Jewish people would say. Yeah. <laughs> Gentiles and Jews are one, Paul says. And slave people and free people are one. Christianity is running this radical message where we let the sinners come right into the church and sit with the right men and women together, upsetting them tremendously. And uh, you need a good balcony like you have over your Baptist church and have the women sit up there on Sunday morning and sinners. Not only the men should be down on the main floor and going to the 12. And keep the laws. Christianity has made religion too easy. You get away with anything in Christianity. And no rules or regulations to keep. So that's not difficult to do religion. And by the way, we did give Jesus a fair trial. How many realize that? <laughs> People are always talk about the trial we gave Jesus. We gave him a fair trial before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court. I ruled over that it meant in my dwelling. We gave Jesus a fair trial. He was threatening the temple, and the reason we put him to death, we had eyewitnesses who had heard him say he was going to destroy the Jewish temple. How many of you remember Jesus saying that? that he was going to destroy the Jewish temple. It's pretty dead. You know he said that. So as guarding the temple, I had to put him to death. We sent spies up into Galilee. Now I'm sorry to have to tell this to a Christian audience. How many have heard of the feeding of the 5,000? You want to know how that really happened from my spies? Before the crowds got there, Jesus put fish and bread in the cave, put Andrew in the cave. He backed up with his hands behind him. It was actually Andrew who was handing out the bread. I'm sorry, I have to relate that to you. As far as the law is concerned, I am a righteous man. I think I've convinced you of that here this evening. And I'd like to have a dialogue with you. I uh, have a few rules I would like you to follow. If you address me, call me sir. And I will try to answer your questions. And just by being with you here tonight, I will have to take a ritual bath when I go home. <laughs> On a cold night, I think. Who would like a question to ask the high priest? Don't be overwhelmed by my colleagues. <laughs>
many Jews believe that one day the temple will be in general. Yes? Sir, you uh, alluded to a, a reading of the lost ark. Has there ever been organized search to try to retrieve the ark? Uh, no excavations are allowed on the temple now. You do remind me of Titus, the general of Roman army. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. Sir, have you uh, heard of Jesus when he drove the money changers out of the temple? And if so, what are your feelings regarding that? That was a terrible day. We lost thousands of dollars for the treasure. <laughs> <laughs> the court of the Gentiles was so large, once the 36 acres was in the court of the Gentiles, that you could have done that in one small section of the temple and the rest of the temple not being made aware of it. So it was an enormous structure, but Jesus did disrupt the worship service. What if you would have somebody on Sunday morning come into your church and chase out the deacons with a collection plate? You would call the police also. You have misjudged this throughout the years. Other questions from your hunting people? Yes. Sir, you said that on the top It will be one just like King David. And this is why we cannot accept Jesus as a Messiah. No Messiah will end up on a cross. That is a death reserved only for criminals. It will be very difficult for the Jewish people to try to understand a criminal as their Messiah. You know, how would you, in the modern world, hear that the God had come into the world and ended up in a public jail and then was put in an electric chair and put to death? How many of you would still worship him? So it's very difficult for me to understand why Christians would worship a crucified Messiah. Messiah will bring Judaism back to its height, like King David's time, and we will rule the world. And that is not happening yet. Yes? Would you be sympathetic towards the uh, position of the Pharisees or the Sadducees? I am a Pharisee myself. Uh, excuse me, Sadducee. And uh, I would say, Pharisees <laughs> with wealthy, work with Rome, try to bring Roman rule and cooperate with it. And uh, so I'm very proud to be a Pharisee. Pharisees were too common and dealt with common people and brought in too many new ideas into Jesus. I would resist that. I'm sure you would too. And yes. Far 
blessing of sun is that happening. And it would be a very difficult thing for Jews today to go back to offering an animal again. And they're so accustomed to the synagogue system. But modern Judaism has lost the insight. Uh, there are too few Orthodox Jews keeping 613 dollars. That's the only way you can have insight is to keep the law. So many Jews don't do that today. Yes, in the back. One is holy can never have a day off. As you can tell by my look. <laughs> you remind me a lot of my third son was so cantankerous. That myth was started by the Christians. You see, the Roman guards fell asleep, and I knew that would happen. That's why we wanted guards there. Disciples. Uh, stole the body away from the kid and started that dinner. And it's persisted ever since, I'm afraid. But I hope you have not accepted that. <laughs> Every time a famous person dies, they start that rumor. <laughs> you remember Nero, when they said he was still alive and coming back to get a commission, and you Western people have now this I 
her death, and this woman had seven husbands. Who in the world is she going to belong to in the next world? She was quite a woman, you might understand. <laughs> Killed seven husbands and talked to her. But uh, well, I thought we talked to Jesus very nicely about that, uh, that trick. And Jesus didn't understand our traditions of Judaism. Paul even called his whole Jewish heritage dumb for Philippian letters. Now, how could any righteous person look back on his religious heritage and call it dumb as he does in Philippians 3? And so, so many of the Christians do not understand nor uh, uh, share in the love of their traditions that they have grown out of. Talk uh, other questions? Uh, we're getting back to the evening sacrifices. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sir, you mentioned that uh, Paul's responsible for, for us not being Jewish, for Christians not being a Jewish line. You know what his name means, don't you? <laughs> Shorty. <laughs> crucifixion and in the days that follow, were there any among your own group that had even the slightest wonder about whether this man truly was who he claimed to be?
Thank <laughs> you. 